Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Retro Radio Sunday on Weird Darkness. Each week I bring you a show from the golden age of radio, but still in the genre of Weird Darkness. I'll have stories of the macabre and horror, mysteries and crime, and even some dark science fiction. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com where you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Minds, MeWe, and more, along with the Weird Darkness Weirdos Facebook group. Coming up, it's an episode from Somebody Knows, a radio show not all that many folks are aware even existed, as it only produced eight episodes in the one summer that it ran. You see, in the summer of 1950, CBS had a problem. On Thursday nights, thousands of people were expecting to tune in to the radio sensation that left people on the edge of their seats each week – Suspense. As successful as Suspense was – it ran from June 1942 through the end of September 1962, a full 20 years – the production still took a well-deserved vacation every summer, something that continues even today on broadcast television when network shows take a break and return each fall. The 1950 summer replacement for radio's suspense was based on the notion that actual crimes could be even more fascinating and thrilling as the fictional ones on suspense. The idea behind the show was that there are no perfect crimes, that someone, somewhere, could have the one missing clue that would help the police apprehend the killer in these often gruesome cases. To help entice that person to come forward, the producers even offered a reward of $5,000, an amount equal to well over $56,000 today, to whomever could come forward with the information that would solve the case of the week, creating an ingenious and rather complicated way to anonymously send the information to the show so that it could be sent to law enforcement agents and still maintain the listener's anonymity. Some of the most sensational cases of the time were dramatized in an informative and entertaining manner. At least, entertaining enough to keep you glued to your radio until suspense came back in the fall. This episode of Somebody Knows aired August 3, 1950, and it tells the story of how on June 26, 1947, Mrs. Eubanks' body was found at the Kansas City, Missouri City dump, strangled to death. It's called The Unsolved Murder of Paula Kohler Eubanks. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Suspense, which is heard on Thursday nights at this hour, is taking its customary summer holiday. Suspense returns to the air four weeks from now on Thursday, August 31st. Ladies and gentlemen, a $5,000 reward will be offered each week on the program immediately following this announcement. You out there, you who think you've committed the perfect crime, the perfect murder, and that there are no clues, no witnesses, 
that your identity is unknown. Listen. Somebody knows. Yes, you, wherever you may be, no matter where you're hiding. Somewhere, sometime, someone listening to this program is going to bring you to justice. Yes? Somebody knows. The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Somebody Knows, a program conceived in the public interest, dedicated to aiding the forces of law and order in the solution of this nation's unsolved crimes. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to recreate for you tonight all the known facts in an actual unsolved murder. Somewhere, someone among you's had contact with the killer or killers. Someone whose identity need never be known has seen evidence or possesses information that can lead to the solution of this crime. In the public interest, the Columbia Broadcasting System offers $5,000 reward for evidence or information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer in this unsolved murder. We ask you then to please listen carefully, for you may be the one to win this reward. Somebody knows. It may be you. And now we open the files on one of this nation's unsolved murders. It's homicide file number A1-1947 of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. The unsolved murder of Paula Kohler Eubanks. It is approximately 10.15 in the morning, Thursday, June 26, 1947. Several men are walking along a corridor in Menorah Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. At what time was he admitted to the hospital, Doctor? I would say it was at approximately 7.30, Mr. Kimbrell. He was in need of immediate medical attention, which we gave him. Then, because of the nature of his injuries, mm. we felt the police should be notified. What about those injuries? Serious? Well, there are two deep lacerations on the right side of the head, and while we're not sure yet, a depressed skull fracture seems indicated. I see. Uh, here's his room now. Just about five minutes, Mr. Kimbrough, his condition. I understand, Doctor. Mr. Mendoza? Mr. Men... Uh, there are some men here who'd like to ask you a few questions. Men? Questions? Yes, Mr. Mendoza. I'm James Kimbrell, prosecutor of Jackson County. These men are Mr. Randall, my assistant, and Detectives Gibson Detectives. and Miller. What is it you... Is it about Paula Eubanks? It is, Mr. Mendoza. Have you any statement for us? I will tell you everything I know, Mr. Kimbrough. The statement of the injured man given on the morning of June 26, 1947 at Menorah Hospital, and later in more detail to Lieutenant Charles Welch at the Homicide Bureau in Kansas City, Missouri, contains in part the following information. My name is Hector Mendoza. I am 22 years of age, single, and live at the YMCA. I came to Kansas City about one month ago from Mexico City to obtain employment and learn the American way of tool designing. While staying at the YMCA, I had my meals at the Mayflower Grill, 403 and a half East 10th Street. While eating at this cafe, I became acquainted with a waitress named Paula Eubanks. I talked and joked with her on many occasions. On Wednesday, June 25th, I asked her for a date. We made arrangements to meet each other about 8.30 p.m. in Boston. On Wednesday evening, June 25th, 1947... Hector Mendoza has his first date with Paula Eubanks. They visit several cafes and taverns, having a gay, pleasant evening, laughing, dancing, and joking. It's about 3.30 a.m. on the morning of Thursday, June 26, 1947, that they return to the Fairfield Hotel at 923 Home Street, where Mrs. Eubanks has her apartment. Would you like to sit out here on the porch? 
talk for a while, Hector? You know I would, Polly, if it is not too late for you. Oh, no. Now everything's been so nice. Here. We can sit down here. Yes, this will be very nice. Oh, it's been such a wonderful night, Hector. You're a very good dancer, you know. How could I be anything else when it was you with whom I was dancing? <laughs> there you go again, saying those nice things. You know, I'm going to miss you when you go to New York. Well, you know I mean them, Polly. As Paula Eubanks and Hector Mendoza sit on the front porch of the hotel talking, a heavy-set man is walking south on Home Street. As he reaches a point opposite the hotel, he turns in, moves up the steps, and onto the porch. That is why you meant so much to me when you, when you made me feel so much at home here in Kansas City. You're so warm and gay and laughing. You. <laughs> All right, you two. Get up. The man is standing beside them. The blue steel automatic in his hand is plainly visible. I said get up. Better do as he says. Get up. Now, put your hands up. All right. I know you. You're new in town. Yes, I... I've been here about six months. Yeah. Look, my friend, why don't... Stand you... still. Do as he tells you. Yeah. If you're going to rob us, take what you want. Yeah. I know you, fella. What's your name? Hector Mendoza. Yeah. <laughs> I know you, fella. What's your name? It is Hector. Hector Mendoza. <laughs> <laughs> Mendoza remains unconscious for several minutes. When he finally recovers, he staggers weakly to his feet. Paul Eubanks and the man are gone. Mendoza walks down the steps and out to the sidewalk. And there, some distance south on Home Street, he sees them enter an old coupe. Then the car drives off. It is now 4.15 a.m., the morning of Thursday, June 26, 1947. An old coupé is heading east on Independence Avenue. Near the 6,000 block, it approaches an old abandoned city dump. Then it slows and turns abruptly into the driveway leading into the dump. It is now approximately 4.30 a.m., the morning of Thursday, June 26, 1947. In a one-room tin shack about ten feet square located in the city dump, Clarence Bayless, former caretaker for the city, is sleeping. Then... What? What, what is it? What? Uh, who's there? What are you doing at that door? Clarence Bayless raises himself up in bed. There's one window in the tin shack. It's about two feet square and located in the upper half of the door. The chest and shoulders of a heavy-set man can be seen dimly against the darkness through that window. I said, what are you doing there? Keep quiet if you know what's good for you. I got a gun. A uh, gun? You heard me, a gun. Take a look at it through the glass. So keep quiet. What? What are you doing with the door? I'm locking you in. Okay. Now remember what I said. Keep quiet, or I'll be back for you. Clarence Bayless remains in bed quietly, listening. Then, after a while, he hears the dim murmur of voices from somewhere outside the north side of the shack. The low, apparently friendly conversation continues for a short while. Then... Honey. Honey, no. Honey, don't kill me. Honey, don't kill me. I'm not going to kill you. 
trying to see if you were still asleep. Clarence Bayless continues to listen from inside the tin shack. He hears a faint sound as though a scuffle is taking place somewhere. It seems to be coming from an old shed some five feet away from Bayless's shack. It lasts a short while and then stops. What? What is it? What do you want now? I just wanted to see if you were still there, minding your own business. Yeah, I'm here. Then see that you stay there. I still got that gun. See it? So stay there and keep on minding your business. Now 4.45 a.m., the morning of Thursday, June 26, 1947. A truck is driving eastward along Independence Avenue in Kansas City, Missouri. As the truck crosses the tracks of the Kansas City Terminal Railway and approaches the old abandoned city dump, two men suddenly run out from an all-night fruit stand across the street. They begin waving frantically at the truck, trying to flag it down. Hey, what's the big idea out there? You want to get killed or something? It's the idea of jumping... The police! Something happened! Go to the police station down the street and tell them to... Police station? What's wrong? What happened? I don't know for sure, but there was a man and a woman. He's nuts or something. He's got a gun. I seen him leave, leave but not her. She's disappeared. The, the noise they were like making... Like that, huh? Maybe... Okay. Okay. I'll get the cops for you. In just a moment, we'll continue with Homicide File Number A-1-1947 of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, the unsolved murder of Paula Kohler Eubanks. If you love old-time radio, you'll want to visit our friends at ClassicRadioStore.com who provide all the shows for me to wear. At ClassicRadioStore.com, you'll find thousands of episodes available in pristine, digitally remastered sound. Every episode they offer at ClassicRadioStore.com has been transferred from the master recordings and digitally remastered for superior sound quality. That's why the episodes that you hear on Weird Darkness sound so clean. And the shows at ClassicRadioStore.com are all uncut, unedited, and are delivered to you as they were originally broadcast, including the classic commercials. You can download great shows that'll chill you and thrill you, such as Suspense, the Whistler, Inner Sanctum, Lights Out, and more. There are mystery and crime shows like Sherlock Holmes, Philip Marlowe, Dragnet, and Sam Spade. they got a great collection of old-time science fiction radio shows like X-1 or Dimension X. Plus, there is a ton of comedy and westerns there, too, if you want to relive the shows of yesteryear. All the shows are available to instantly digitally download and the links never expire, so you can order them now and listen to them anytime you'd like. And because you're a listener of Weird Darkness, you can save 20% on any and all radio shows on the website by using the promo code WEIRD at checkout. Just visit ClassicRadioStore.com, select all the radio show packages you want, then at checkout use the promo code WEIRD and save 20% on your whole purchase. That's ClassicRadioStore.com, promo code WEIRD at checkout. Here's a message for young women who are looking for an interesting and worthwhile career. In order to meet the constantly rising demand for nurses, the nursing profession offers untold opportunities for ambitious, healthy girls who are at least high school graduates. From the time you become a student nurse, you have a chance to work with fine doctors and scientists and to help your fellow men. Inquire at your nearest hospital about how you can become a student nurse. Now back to Somebody Knows and a true case history of an actual murder. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue with the rest of the factual information concerning file number A1-1947 from the records of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. 
The Unsolved Murder of Mrs. Paula Kohler Eubanks. Remember, $5,000 will be paid for information leading to the arrest and conviction of her killer. It's approximately 4.50 a.m., the morning of Thursday, June 26, 1947. In response to the truck driver's message, Officers Anderson and McCrary have arrived at the city dump from the Sheffield station in police car 302. Clarence Bayless is leading them back to the shed where the events of the past half hour had taken place. And by the time I got out, this guy was gone, driving away. Did you get the license number? No, like I say, he was already driving away, but I hear these funny noises in this shed next to mine. Here, here, this one. They were inside. The, the noises came from here, too. Okay, we'll look around. Come on, let's see what we can Nothing in here but a lot of junk, Bayless. You sure they were inside here? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. That, that's where the noises came from. Well, there's nobody in here now. You're sure that lady didn't leave with her? Oh, I tell you, she didn't. I, I seen through my window. She must be around here somewhere. She must be. Okay, okay, we'll look around. For over ten minutes, officers Anderson and McCrary searched that junk and debris-filled shed, their flashlights affording the only illumination. And then... Here, give me a hand with this. I yeah. think maybe... Here. Give me a hand. They start pulling apart a pile of junk at one side of the shed. They remove several tin buckets, a large sheet of plywood some eight feet square, finally an old automobile seat cushion. Hmm. Looks like Bayless was right. The lady didn't leave this shed. <laughs> At that same moment at police headquarters, two detectives are working the midnight to 8 a.m. homicide bureau shift. They're detectives Wayne Gibson and Isla Miller. Talk about your quiet nights. This one's really dragging by. Nothing much happening for a fact, but you never know. KGPE, Anderson, car 302. Hello, KGPE. Car 302, KGPE. Dead woman, found at dump at Independence Avenue and White. Dead woman, what Independence are you Avenue about and White. Quiet from nights. Okay, well, a guy can't be right all the time. Let's go. Detectives Gibson and Miller leave immediately in cruiser number 22 and go to the scene of the crime. Their initial homicide report, as given to Chief of Detectives Frank B. Collins, contains the following information. On arrival at Independence Avenue in White, officers Anderson and McQuarrie, car 302, directed us to an old shed which is located on what used to be a city dump. Lying on the floor, we found the victim. She was lying face down. Her face was bloody and spots of blood were around the body and on the walls of this shed. Lieutenant Welch was notified immediately, also the prosecutor's office. Within a few minutes after his notification, Lieutenant Charles Welch, head of homicide, arrived at the scene and was fully informed of the situation. What about the identification, Gibson? None made as yet, Lieutenant. Well, who's representing the coroner's office? Deputy Coroner Jack Gibbs. Yes, and as soon as you're through, Lieutenant, I'll send the body to the J.P. Shield funeral home. What about you, Kilbane? We're through with the picture. The lab men finished up, too. All right, then. She can be removed. The dispatcher is trying to get through to you, Lieutenant. He thinks he has something for you about this. Thanks, Miller. I'll take it in your cruiser. KGPE, Lieutenant Welch, KGPE. Lieutenant Welch, KGPE. We received a call from the Fairfield Hotel at 923 Holmes. The managers report some large spots of blood on the front porch. Also a woman's raincoat and black pocketbook on one of the chairs. Mm. They belong to a Mrs. Paula Eubanks, one of their tenants. They've checked and say her room's empty, hasn't been slept in. All right, dispatcher, uh, we'll check on it. At the Fairfield Hotel, the police talk to Mr. and Mrs. Charles Logeman, the managers. Then Mrs. Logeman is taken to the funeral home. She identifies the victim of the killing as Mrs. Paula Kohler Eubanks. (laughs) 
Meanwhile, Dr. James Walker, the coroner, has made a preliminary medical examination. The findings... It would appear without thorough autopsy that Mrs. Eubanks died from strangulation. The bruises on the victim's hands, face, and neck include those apparently inflicted by the killer while strangling her to stop her screams. It is also apparent that she was struck a number of times by blows from some blunt instrument, probably a pistol. There is no evidence of criminal assault. In Paul Eubanks' black leather purse, left behind on the porch, is a small book. It contains a number of names and addresses. Among those names is that of Hector Mendoza. With the call from the Menorah Hospital that he was admitted in an injured condition, Mendoza is questioned and his statement taken. In it, he gives the police a description of the man who struck him and walked away with Paul Eubanks. A general pickup is immediately broadcast. KGPE, all stations. Pick up for investigation of murder, one white man, age 28 to 30, height 5 foot 10, weight 170 to 180, dirty blonde, small mustache, heavy, thick shoulders. When last seen, was wearing dark, double-breasted suit, dark felt hat. KGPE, 1142. In an effort to find some possible motive for the crime, and a possible clue to the killer's identity, the police make a thorough check of all Mrs. Eubanks' friends, a thorough investigation into her past life. Mrs. Margaret Dallas of 920 Home Street tells the police... I used to work at the Mayflower Grill with Polly. Her close friends always called her Polly. She was friendly, a nice girl, and she had lots of admirers. I can't think of any reason why anyone would want to... to kill her. Mrs. Ann Kramer of Overland Park, a sister of Polly Eubanks, had this to report. Polly was a wonderful girl. She... She had some trouble in her life. She'd been divorced from her husband and remarried to him and then separated again. But she she had a wonderful spirit. She was just crazy about Nancy. That's Nancy Kay, her little twenty month old adopted girl. Kept her in a in a nursery and I just don't know what's gonna happen to Nancy Kay now. <laughs> Then, a strange and unusual development takes place in the case. Mrs. Dora Ann Morell of 908 Jefferson Street, who'd worked as a waitress with Mrs. Eubanks at the Mayflower Grill some two months before, pays a visit to William H. Randall, assistant prosecutor of Jackson County. Polly called to me one day at the restaurant. She had a pad of restaurant order blanks in her hand. She wrote something on the back of one of those sheets and gave it to me. She told me to read them if anything ever happened to her. Here it is. Mrs. Morell hands over the order blank. On the back of it, Paula Eubanks had written a number of Bible references. The references were Proverbs 8.12, Revelations 3.12, Matthew 11.14, Matthew 17.10 through 14, and Mark 9.13. The prosecutor's office makes a careful study of the verses designated on the back of that order pad. Then, this statement is issued. The uh, verses apparently were selected to be read in chronological order by listing, since the 14th verse of the 17th chapter of Matthew ends, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, and the uh, reference continues with Mark 9:13, which reads, but I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. <clears throat> the name Elias is frequent in the verses, beginning with Matthew 11:14. In the 17th chapter of Matthew, the name Elias occurs three times, including the 12th verse. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall the Son of Man suffer of them. In the uh, next verse, Matthew 17, 13 continues. The disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Whatever Mrs. Paul Eubanks may have had in mind when she wrote those biblical references is not apparent to us. Not yet.
Now listen carefully, please. Listen, all of you, wherever you may be. We're going to give you a recapitulation of all the pertinent facts in the unsolved murder of Paula Kohler Eubanks. Better make a note of them. And remember, by following the instructions we shall give you in a moment, you may be the one to earn a $5,000 reward. Now, here are the actual facts in the case. Mrs. Paula Kohler Eubanks, 27 years of age, was strangled and beaten to death in an abandoned city dump at approximately 6100 Independence Avenue in Kansas City, Missouri. The time, approximately 4.40 a.m., Thursday, June 26th, 1947. Now, here is a description of the man wanted for investigation in the murder as broadcast by the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Please listen carefully. Age, 28 to 30. Height, 5 foot 10. Weight, 170 to 180. Dirty blonde, small mustache, heavy, thick shoulders. When last seen, was wearing dark, double-breasted suit, dark felt hat. Ladies and gentlemen, if any of you possesses information that may have a bearing on the unsolved murder of Paula Kohler Eubanks, and please don't send in guesses or hunches, but only actual, authentic information. Follow these instructions so that your name and identity need never be made known unless you wish. Now, please listen carefully. Write your information on a plain sheet of paper. Do not sign your name. Instead, sign it with six numbers, any arrangement of any six numbers. Then tear off a blank corner of that paper with a ragged edge. Write the same six numbers on that corner and keep it. Mail the rest of the paper with the information... To Somebody Knows, Hollywood, California. You need tell no one what you have done. Mail your letter to Somebody Knows, Hollywood, California. And if the information you've supplied leads to the arrest and conviction of the killer of Paula Kohler Eubanks, we'll announce your signature number on this program. Then, if you don't want your name to be known, go to your lawyer or your doctor, your priest, minister, or rabbi, and have him present the torn corner of the paper to any CBS station. In this way, you do not need to appear in person. If the torn corner matches the original paper containing the information, the $5,000 reward will be yours. Remember, you, wherever you are, you whose name need never be known, may win a reward of $5,000. Next week, at the same time, we'll present another true case history of unsolved murder. It's homicide file number HF12342 from the records of the Boston, Massachusetts Police Department. The unsolved murder of Samuel I. Paris. You out there, you who have murdered in cold blood and think you've gotten away with it, listen. You cannot escape. There is no perfect crime. Remember, you are not unknown. Somebody knows. Tonight's case was written by Sidney Marshall from information in the files of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Research was by Maurice Zim. Music was composed and played by Milton Charles. Somebody Knows is a James L. Safier production in association with CBS by arrangement with the Chicago Sun-Times and is based on a copyright owned by W.L. Finstad. It was narrated and directed by Jack Johnstone. In order to be eligible for the reward, Letters containing actual, authentic information leading to the arrest and conviction of the killer or killers of Paula Kohler Eubanks must be addressed to Somebody Knows, Hollywood, California, and must be postmarked not later than midnight, August 23, 1950. Arrest of the guilty person or persons must occur within 90 days of that date, and conviction must be within one year of tonight's broadcast. 
If more than one person gives the information leading to conviction, our judges will divide the $5,000 reward among them in proportion to the importance the judges attach to the facts supplied. And in this, the decision of our judges will be final. Until next Thursday at the same time, this is Frank Goss saying good night. And remember, somebody knows. Now stay tuned for Casey, crime photographer, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you'll find Arthur Godfrey's daytime program every Monday through Friday on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thanks for listening to this week's retro radio episode of Weird Darkness. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio. And a huge thanks to our friends at ClassicRadioStore.com for generously providing the old-time radio shows you hear on Weird Darkness Retro Radio Sunday. Remember, you can save 20% on all of the ClassicRadioStore.com shows by using the promo code WEIRD at checkout. The rest of the week, I narrate new stories of the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, and mysteries, so be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already done so. I upload episodes seven days a week. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Minds, MeWe, and the show's Weirdos Facebook group on the contact social page at weirddarkness.com. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, click on Tell Your Story or call the dark line toll-free at 1-877-277-5944. That's 1-877-277-5944. Weird Darkness is a production of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness 2021. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.